e ngā mana e ngā reo e ngā hau e whā, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, kia ora whāna. Kia ora. Uh, great to be back uh, for the second day of ATEPS, uh, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of energy in the room for the rest of the day. And thanks uh, again to uh, Jennifer and Suzanne and all the team who've made this such a memorable event so far. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Jacoby, and I am the Executive Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum, which is an organisation in the private sector that brings together our major exporters and business associations with an interest in trade policy. Yes, we love trade, we love talking about trade, uh, and we especially love doing trade, uh, and um, I'm really pleased that we've got this opportunity to speak with you today, because what we're talking about uh, are FTAs. FTAs, RTAs, PTAs, they've got many and varied um, uh, titles. Uh, a friend of mine once said actually that free trade agreement was a complete misnomer because they mostly weren't free, uh, they weren't just about trade, and nobody seemed to agree on anything. Uh, but there they are, they are very much a part of the landscape, and in the last 10 to 15 years, New Zealand has been particularly active on this front, negotiating a series of mostly comprehensive uh, um, free trade agreements, both plurilateral ones, the mega regionals like CPTPP and RCEP you've been hearing about, and now this new creation of IPEF, which we'll also be hearing about, uh, but also bilateral FDAs with other important partners, uh, and indeed our coverage now for our trade of FDAs is particularly strong. I'm sure we'll hear about that in a moment. But there are lots of elements of these things to work out, and the good news is that this morning we have a very distinguished and erudite, and may I say large, panel uh, of experts to talk to you, and I'd like to introduce them now. And can I first welcome uh, to the panel, and indeed to New Zealand, my friend uh, Deborah Elms, who's come all the way from Singapore uh, to be with us. Uh, Deborah is the executive director and founder of the Asian Trade Centre in Singapore, and a very well-known uh, advocate and commentator on uh, trade and trade policy. It's great to have you here, Deborah. I'm pleased to welcome Shiro Armstrong, but you've met him already uh, from the... Um, Crawford School of Public Policy in the College of Asia and Pacific at the Australian National University. It's great to have this trans-Tasman flavour, Shiro, of this of this Fantastic. gathering. And you're you're no my hara mai kia te aroa. You're very you're very welcome here among us. Can I also introduce uh, one of our own, Dr. Maureen Benson Ray, one of our own, indeed from Auckland University. Should just a note: I also attended Auckland University. Great to be back. Great to be back again. Associate Professor in the Department of Management and International Business in the Business School uh, and has focused a lot on European studies over her career. Maureen, it's lovely to have you with us. Uh, can I introduce Simon Tucker? Uh, Simon is a good friend of mine also, a board member of the International Business Forum, I should tell you. I've uh, got to be careful what I say. Um, uh, Simon is Director of Global Sustainability, Stakeholder Affairs and Trade at Fonterra, which is, of course, New Zealand's largest company and friendliest agricultural cooperative. Thanks, Simon. And um, last, but by certainly no means least, my old friend Stuart Horn uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, divisional manager in the economic division uh, with a long history and career of working on, on trade issues. Stuart is from the government and he is here to help us uh, this morning. And indeed, Stuart, it's to you I'm going to turn first uh, to give us a kind of a governmental perspective on the matters that we want to consider today. So kia ora, welcome. Kia tato, talofalaba, malo elele. It's really great to be in this fala here in Tamaki Makaura, having spent quite a bit of my career in the Pacific, including living in Samoa. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying back being in the fale and, and speaking here today. So. Um, um, as Stephen said, of course, Stu Horn talking um, I'm going to give a brief overview of, of our trade policy as it relates to, to FTAs. Um, it's always a difficult time. There's been two ministers, four panels, Vangeli's still to come. So, you know, I don't know what I'm going to say that, that, that hasn't already been said, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, 
I thought what I'd try and is, is talk a bit, as I say, about trade policy and how New Zealand's FTA situate within that trade policy. Um, I'm very conscious of, of Rob's presentation already that's talked about FTAs and, and, and sort of, which was really useful, and, and, and I have to say, Rob, I agree with pretty much everything you said, um, so I'll take that all out of my speech. Um, I think one of the things that's worth taking a step back is, is sort of, you heard the Minister talk yesterday about trade for all and, and how that's such a critical part of where we, where we are and how we see our FTAs. Probably worth taking a step back about where that comes from. Um, I was doing a bit of research for this speech and there was an article which referred to TPP as, quote, a crowning triumph or a sovereign assault. Hope you're listening, Stacey Kirk, because you wrote that article so um, back in the day. but. Uh, um, but that was the challenge that, that came through at the time, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, MFAT probably didn't promote the benefits of free trade and the inclusive elements of free trade and, and why that this was a good thing as well as we could have. I think the protests around TPPP, issues around investor state this dispute settlement, sort of how trade supported Māori. I mean, you saw the video from Moana last night. There's a lot of valid points that got made there. And I think for us, there was some important wake up calls and how we actually engage more widely. And so I think it's fair to say now, we do look at FTAs through a lens of, you know, about how does it deliver for all New Zealanders, you know. We're still a staunch advocate of free trade. We're still a staunch advocate of international institutions that support it. But it's how do we take, alongside international trade rules, that along with government policies, build sustainable and inclusive economic development. And again, you heard Minister Terakat in his speech about trade for all and why that's important. And he was really focused on the elements around treaty. Um, so, but what I thought I'd do is perhaps, again, work about how it's in practice. Um, one of the things that we worked through is, is a, what we call the government's um, trade recovery strategy 2.0, um, which essentially is sort of how we're refreshing our trade strategy in a sort of post-COVID world. So, um, and how do we use that to sort of reinvigorate the international trade architecture? So our strategy focuses on, on um, four goals. The first one um, will come as no surprise to you all, which is sustainable and inclusive trade. And again, that's underpinned by the Trade for All a a agenda. The second one's about trade and export lift, and how do you support the capability of New Zealand exporters Kiwi businesses, um, and that's things like trade missions, trade diplomacy, a lot of the card mahi that NZT does. Um, the next bit is the architecture, and I suppose that's where I'm going to drill into today, which is things like free trade agreements, WTO, how the architecture within which business can trade under predictable rules. Um, the OECD is a critical element of that, APEX a critical element of that, and a range of OP, open plurilaterals which you've heard about like DEPA form part of that too. And then the final element of the, um, the strategy is resilience, you know, which is the vulnerabilities that have been exposed by the pandemic, sometimes exacerbated by the pandemic. How do we strengthen New Zealand's trade against future shocks? Um, so how do we focus on the diversification of trade, how do we mitigate supply chain pressures, and how do we work across government um, for things like emissions reduction. So yes, yeah, so sustainability, trade and export lift, architecture and resilience, and for those of you who like their acronyms, STAR. So, um, but equally, it's not just about negotiating new trade agreements. We can't just sit there like a magpie and say, right, what's the next shiny thing? It's actually how do we make sure that the trade agreements we've got are fit for purpose and how do we upgrade them and how do we make them better? Um, so again, that they, that they, they actually fulfil the modern needs. So I think, you know, we've got to, we, we've got to look there, um, and particularly sustainability, which I know there's been a lot talked about because it is an increasing part of our, our trade story and it's an increasing part of how New Zealand is, is seen in the world. Um, there was a, recently we were ranked, because um, we were included for the first time in the Sustainable Trade in Index, which ranked 30 mostly APEC economies against the in indexes, environmental protection, societal development pillars. We came first, um, particularly labour standards, political stability, air pollution and environmental standards. Um, for those of you going, really? That just shows you that there's a lot of bad stuff out there, but, but that was the, the rankings. And, and, and I think for us, we have been for a long time using focused on using trade rules to um, address sustainable development objectives. Um, I mean, examples are environmentally harmful subsidies and agriculture, fisheries and fossil fuel subsidies, and working particularly in, in, in the WTO and APEC. 
So um, I'm sort of conscious you know about most of the FTA initiatives after a day of, of this. If you haven't, you haven't been listening. Um, but but I'm, as Stephen said, I'm the government representative here to talk about FTAs. Um, so it's worth running through a highlights reel. Um, and I'm going to make no apologies that it's a long highlights reel because Vangelis has been working us hard. Um, so, I mean, I think we've heard, first of all, that this year we are, we're hosting the, the CPTPP um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So it's a year-long program of meetings and events. It's a big year for us. Um, and, and for us, we want to make sure that it reflects our, our interests and expectations, including for treaty partners. Um, UK accession looms large, and um, the, we don't overlook the strategic uh, importance of that, particularly in a year when we will be ratifying our FTA with the UK. So that's a big deal. So that leads into that, that you know, February 22 is when we signed the FTA with the UK. Um, again, you've heard it's high quality, it's ambitious, it's, 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 it's a significant um, FTA that, that covers all the bases. We're pretty pleased with it. Simon will talk about how happy he is from a dairy perspective shortly. Um, a Steph notes it's got an inclusive digital trade chapter. So there's a lot of good things about it. Um, but as the Minister noted, it's also the first FTA that was negotiated and signed under the government's trade for all agenda. Um, and that's reflected through the FTA. There's dedicated chapters on trade and gender, supporting women's economic empowerment, Māori trade and economic cooperation, trade and development. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of useful stuff in there that we are very focused on making work and making happen so it isn't just sitting in black and white and it goes on a shelf. Um, it's got the most far-reaching trade and environment provisions we've ever negotiated. Um, there's commitments to eliminate fisheries subsidies, eliminating fossil fuel subsidies, and promoting sustainable agriculture. Um, and it prioritises the elimination of tariffs on 290 environmentally beneficial products, which is the largest list in any FTA to date. So, um, you know, we're pretty pleased with, with what's in there. Um, so. It's also, for the first time in any FTA, acknowledges the important role that sustainable Māori environmental approaches can play in areas like fisheries, forestry and agriculture. Um, equally, um, we're pretty pleased with the progress of the EU FTA, which, is, which in many ways took longer, harder. You're dealing with a lot more countries. Um, I served in Brussels. I'm still astonished we got there, to be honest. Um, Stephen served in Brussels. He's still astonished we got there, even he has to say certain things. Um, but it's more than um, value. I think it's reflective of our shared and our common values, and I think that that's an important point. Um, we're like-minded with the EU. We think that trade should build prosperity for all. It just supports our efforts on climate change. Um, so it is, it is that point that about sustainability and how we sell things that I think is, is critical, because that's how we're perceived in the world. And increasingly, if you talk to NZT, it's about moving from volume to values. You know, If you go and see Fonterra, they don't just talk about selling dairy powder. They talk about New Zealand grass-fed. You know, There's a much more of a story. So I think these are critical, important elements to be in there. Um, and I think we're pretty proud and we're pretty hopeful that that's going to move through the processes as the European Union has made a big deal about this FTA because of the sustainability elements and the fact that New Zealand is like-minded. And let's not hide from it. We would not have an FTA if we did not have those processes in place. I've got IPF on the list, but Mark Sinclair is here, so I'm going to leave him to talk about that in, in due course. I think there's a few things I talked about, the importance of implementation, though, and that's, that's critical, and making sure that you don't just take an FTA and sit on it. So this year, we've just concluded in the last few days in Vietnam the Ainsfitter um, um, up, upgrade. And so, you know, that's, that's worth $7 billion of the experts a year to, to ASEAN. Um, we trade more that block in a week than we did in a year in the early 70s, just to put that in perspective. So um, we're going to be focusing on things that improve compliance costs, improve transparency, greater certainty for exporters and investors when operating in ASEAN, um, more streamlined customs procedures, things that make the boat go faster when it comes to actually ensuring trade. It's not just tariffs, it's all the bits from point A to point B. Because that's a critical thing with an FTA, it's not just about removing the tariffs, it's about making it work better for exporters. Um, so, and again, we've got a trade and sustainable development chapter, which is the first ever in an ASEAN FTA, and we've agreed to cooperate on a range of the things that we've talked about, women, um, women's economic empowerment, labour standards. Um, so that's, that's pretty critical. Um, last but not least, because I know I've got time, um, on at the beginning of 22, we also saw the entry into force of the upgrade to our FTA with, with China. 
So again, I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious that there's four expert panelists here that they've got a range of insights. As I said, I'm gonna leave Vangeli to talk about open plurilateralism and the increasing challenges, frankly, of us turning up next year and laying down a set of achievements that comes even close to what we did in 2022 because it was a banner year in terms of getting FTAs concluded and upgrades concluded. Um, I know I'm biased, I'll make no blows about that, but, but I think we're pretty proud and in fact how we've worked to meet the government's brief for a trade for all agenda with inclusiveness and sustainability at its heart. We can and we're gonna get better but speaking as someone that started in the trade negotiations business 20 years ago, I think we've come a long way. So thank you very much. Thank you. Kia ora, Stuart. Thank you very much. I think that point about implementation uh, is extremely well made. It's not just the agreement once signed and then forgotten. It's how we make them work. And I'm sure we'll come back to that now. Now, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've asked our international guests to focus a little more on the, uh, the broader, uh, the, the bigger plurilateral regional agreements and our uh, New Zealand uh, team to focus more on the bilaterals. But I'm sure they'll say whatever they like uh, and that'll be great too. So Deborah, we'd love to hear from you now. Yeah, I don't want to go stand. Um, so thank you very much for being here. I am, I am amazed, actually, by the number of people in this room who want to talk trade. I think that's fantastic. Um, and I think it's testament to me to why New Zealand does so well in various trade arenas, because you effectively, much more effectively than most places, I think, harness government, with business, with academics, with the uh, NGO community and so forth, in, in all pull in the same general direction. And I think that is incredibly striking. I mean, it may not feel that weird to you all to be in a room like this, but it feels very weird to me, having been in ASEAN especially and then in Asia in general, this sort of thing rarely happens, and if it does, it's much more divided. So we would see, as an example, like a table of the trade trade officials at one end, and we would see academics at one end, and you know business at the other end. We would not see this sort of happy mingling, which I think is fantastic. And I think it, for me again, it's sort of testament to how you you manage to do trade particularly well. So I just want to note one agreement that you didn't mention that I think is fantastic for New Zealand, which is. RCEP, the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement. So RCEP, we finally got our 15th country, Philippines, to say yes. So now, with all 15 in this, including New Zealand, we have a regional agreement in Asia for Asia. And I think that is an important milestone. Um, it will take time to implement, and I'm delighted that New Zealand will be part of the implementation process, and especially for you to be thinking about as a development partner, assisting some of the RCEP members in implementing their commitments. Because at the end of the day, like what do we do these trade agreements for? Really what we do these trade agreements for in my view, and, and I'm a bit of an old fashioned person on this, I think we do it because we wanna have more certainty and less risk for companies, especially as they go overseas. And that for me is the fundamental purpose of a trade agreement, is to lower that risk, increase the certainty of outcomes. It's not 100%, it's not a magic bullet, it doesn't solve all of your problems, but it does make it a lot easier for you to sell your goods and services overseas and to purchase goods and services from, from abroad into your market. That is fundamental to actually growing businesses. And for me, I often look at trade agreements from the perspective of small companies, and New Zealand, like most places, is dominated by small businesses. Getting a small business to export goods and services is difficult. It's hard. It, it, I'm always kind of amazed that it happens at all because when you think of all the things that you have to get right in order to export something, it's a bloody miracle that anyone manages to do it at all. So I think if you don't have a trade agreement as a mechanism to help with that process, it's even tougher for small businesses. And so, again, one of the reasons why we do these agreements is to give you new opportunities, new markets. And I just wanna mention, and I, don't, I know I don't have a ton, ton of time here, but I just wanna mention CPTPP in particular, even though I just talked about RCEP, the importance of RCEP, many of your small businesses are a little, little more familiar with the RCEP markets, right? Because it's Australia, New Zealand, all of ASEAN, China, Japan, Korea. Those are markets that feel a little more familiar, I think, for New Zealand businesses. So it's an important agreement. You should pay attention to it. But I think it's less novel. What TPP does, or CPTPP does, is it gives you access to different markets 
And it again allows, I would argue, New Zealand businesses, news sources to look for business opportunities, and particularly on the Latin American side. I know we don't talk about this enough, but you now have access to Chile, Peru, and Mexico through CPTPP. You will have access, fingers crossed, soon to the UK. These are markets that are not necessarily ones that small businesses have looked at in the past. But from my perspective, they're markets where I suspect New Zealand businesses could be highly competitive. Because you're coming in on the back of a very, very good, very strong, and very powerful New Zealand brand. Then you come in with your own services and product offerings. And I think when you go into these markets, like a Chile, let's say, I think you will be much more competitive than you might be if you said, I'm going to go to Korea. You know, Korea is a tough market to crack into. It's a big one. It's very competitive. Um, and so I think what's great about something like a TPP and the fact that New Zealand pushed it so hard, so hard, <laughs> to get this thing over the line, to keep it going, to build the momentum, to expand it, to expand it not just with the UK, but potentially, again, future expansion. We have a couple of other, especially Latin American countries like Costa Rica in the pipeline. The advantage of that, again, from the perspective of New Zealand is that it's giving new opportunities for expansion with, again, lowered risk and greater certainty about what those outcomes will be. So the reason why we do these trade agreements, and I think New Zealand is, a, is for me, sort of class A for what, you know, the example, is to provide better opportunities. And to provide better opportunities for outbound trade, but also to provide better conditions for inbound trade. I think that's crucial. You can't be a small island nation and be disconnected from the rest of the world. That doesn't work. And so having this network of deep, comprehensive trade agreements provides those kinds of benefits and access that I think matter. They make a real world, everyday difference for New Zealanders, uh, both in New Zealand and of course you have so many New Zealanders who are not in New Zealand who can also benefit from this. So again, I'd like to encourage all of you, I'm thrilled you're here, encourage all of you to think about ways in which you can leverage these trade deals. If you have difficulties with them, those of you in the room who are trying to access markets or use these trade agreements, there are resources like Stephen, for example, who can help you figure out how to do this better. And I would suggest also MFAT has been remarkably open in allowing comments and whatever, you know, if you say there's a problem here, this shouldn't be a problem, MFAT often has your back, which I think is fantastic, in sorting out whatever you think the problems are. So use these trade agreements as that lever to give you additional competitiveness in markets, especially markets you might not, not normally think of. And, and the range of agreements that New Zealand has negotiated makes it, should be, easier for Kiwi uh, businesses to do business globally in ways that ultimately provide opportunities for growth and expansion domestically. So I think it's fantastic. Thanks very much. Kia ora, Deborah, and thank you for um, bringing us back to the um, importance of free trade agreements for small and medium-sized enterprises. You're talking about uh, all of the New Zealand economy here, um, present company accepted, Simon, although even globally, uh, maybe you classify yourself a little different, that's not in the small category, but anyway. Um, and indeed, I, I think we're going to come back to this point again later when we talk a bit more about inclusion and how we can make these agreements work better uh, for those who haven't always been included in the past. So thank you for that. Um, a voice from Australia, uh, Shiro, uh, please give us your perspective. Uh, great. Look, thanks for the opportunity again to, to talk about regional trade agreements and I think it's useful following on from um, what Deborah said to talk about um, IPEF, CPTPP and RCEP and specifically um, I want to spend a bit more time on RCEP and the opportunity there um, and I think it presents a unique opportunity uh, that New Zealand um, in particular should be um, active in. Um, but let me start with IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, um, following on from a question in yesterday morning's panel on, you know, whether Australia and New Zealand should be part of it. Uh, and I said, of course, well, you know, IPEF is defined more by what it isn't than what it is. You know, it's not a traditional agreement. No market access in the United States. So the allure of the TPP was market access in the US for signing up to higher standards and stricter rules. 
Um, but like I said yesterday, it's what we have to work with out of the United States, and it's very important that um, we're actively shaping that. Um, because the United States isn't going back to the CPTPP anytime soon, um, and and it's what we have to, to work with and strengthen. So, um, you know, there's no US market access. It's done by executive order. So, of course, we saw when President Trump came in um, to office and started signing these executive orders and tearing things up. It could be torn up by the next uh, US president if it's a Republican. Um, and it's not clear how much of this IPEF is going to be binding at all. Uh, and even parts of it that look like they will be non-binding, um, India uh, is having trouble signing up to. So India is not in the, the trade pillar. Um, I'll, I'll come back to, to India. So as Alan Gingell said yesterday, um, under the Biden administration, we have America first, just with better manners. Uh, and I think the United States is still dealing with um, deep structural domestic challenges that's going to keep it focused internally uh, and, as I said yesterday, a source of uncertainty in international um, economic policy for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I was just in Washington last month um, doing the rounds, talking to people about where the US is headed on trade, it's all very depressing, um, came away extremely pessimistic. Um, you know, a, a couple of takeaways people mentioned, one was um, the Biden administration is preoccupied with redistributing gains from trade, but without a trade policy and gains from trade to redistribute, they're just um, um, redistributing the pie without growing it, essentially. And, and also, we're all used to India uh, and its behaviour in international economic forums, vetoing itself out of rel relevance. Um, well, you know, it's essentially told that you can expect the same from the United States going forward. So India is hard enough to deal with, US is just bigger. That leaves us with a big question as to what we do. So we have IPEF, of course, but what do we do with the multilateral system and what we have to work with? Um, I think the first point is to recognise our deep, shared, strategic interest in the multilateral trading system and purposefully and, and carefully build on that. Um, so we want open, regional, and plurilateral arrangements that complement and strengthen the WTO, not ones that act as substitutes for the WTO that would weaken the system. We want to strengthen the system. We want to expand membership, of course, of RCEP, CPTPP, uh, and of course, there are already countries in the process and lining up to join uh, these agreements. The United Kingdom, China, Taiwan, um, uh, with CPTPP in particular. And I think this is where it's going to be a lot of hard work but we've got to be very careful in how we approach China's bid to, to join the CPTPP. I think the first thing is to recognise China has a huge stake in the existing system. Um, it is signed up to the multi-party interim arbitration arrangement. It is an RCEP and now has put its hand up to join CPTPP and the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. Um, and I think we need to take China's application to join CPTPP seriously. Um, now, there's been a lot of trust lost um, in Australia vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, and Japan is very wary of letting China into the CPTPP um, because of the dream of still getting the United States back in. But um, let's not be mistaken, this is China putting its hand up for the rules that the United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand and the rest of us wrote. Uh, and I think it's pretty important that we engage in a process of negotiation, carefully and clearly defining the milestones in Chinese reform that are needed for its membership. And we need to do this without eroding the rules and standards. And of course, when we think about Taiwan membership, keeping the door open to the United States, uh, that's just a bit of creativity that we need, um, uh, making sure the Chinese cannot veto um, original signatories to the TPP, for example. Um, and on Taiwan, it's a lifetime ago that Taiwan joined uh, APEC and the WTO with China, um, but uh, with China, the United States, both um, supporting movement towards a free trade area of the Asia and Pacific through APEC, and of course Taiwan's an APEC member, I'm sure there are ways to think about a long process of Chinese and Taiwanese accession to CPTPP. So I want to now shift to RCEP, where I think a lot of the main action in the region uh, is going to be and, and should be. Um, and just to 
to remind ourselves what an amazing asset this is. Um, a, an agreement created by ASEAN, thought of in Indonesia, and led to completion um, by ASEAN, not China-led, as some of the press likes to say, um, all over the world, uh, but at a time of huge uncertainty where protection, protectionism is on the rise in Europe, the United States and everywhere, for this part of the world to make a strong statement that not only we're we holding the line, we're not closing markets up, we're opening markets and agreeing to new rules. It's the first binding region-wide agreement um, in Asia, and that's significant. So it's got a whole of region approach to economic integration and importantly, an economic cooperation pillar right in the middle of it. And that differentiates RCEP from other agreements. I want to spend a bit of time for that, on that because it's a framework for deepening economic and political cooperation. Now, it's an economic cooperation pillar that builds on ANSFTA and the useful capacity building on competition policy um, in ASEAN that was done through ANSFTA and, and um, the other technical cooperation. But I think it should be so much more, and it, um, it likely will be so much more than capacity building, technical cooperation, um, and, and I'll explain why. Uh, it's, it's a real opportunity to upgrade rules and upgrade standards through this process. Um, and not just that, it's to cooperate on things that can't be negotiated easily um, and lead up to, to negotiating things. And one reason is there's a, an infrastructure in built into RCEP. Um, there's a minister's, annual minister's meeting written into the agreement uh, there's going to be an RCEP secretariat uh, and a joint committee, including working groups underneath or committees underneath. Australia is co-chairing the joint committee uh, this year with Indonesia. Um, and I think you know, that's going to be very important for implementation, um, the, the other panellists have spoken about, but there's also um, the ability for this grouping to call a leaders meeting. So uh, leaders from RCEP members will um, meet this year uh, and they're not going to want to just talk about implementation. Uh, leaders are, want to, are going to want to get together to talk about things, um, uh, pressing issues in the region, um, economics plus. All right, so this is a real opportunity to talk regionally about energy transition, managing climate change, EV supply chains, look at what's happening in the United States and Europe with subsidies. I mean, we've got the whole EV supply chain in this part of the, the world. Um, dealing with infrastructure investment issues like that, new rules on digital, um, why not bring in some of the deeper and, and DEA provisions into to RCEP, for example, and of course supply chain resilience, which is a big issue in IPEF, but talking about supply chain resilience in the Indo-Pacific economic framework without mentioning China is pretty strange to me. You know, China has a pretty strong interest in um, supply chain resilience itself. Um, and there's also the opportunity to use this framework creatively to, to invite in non-members around specific issues, including India, um, finding a pathway for engagement with India for eventual membership. So at the beginning of COVID um, in 2020, when ASEAN convened an ASEAN plus three summit, you had leaders from Northeast Asia and, and Southeast Asia together to discuss how to coordinate and cooperate on the, the early days of the pandemic, Australia and New Zealand are sitting there, um, sitting in the breeze by ourselves um, watching this. I, I think RCEP needs to be the new framework with the infrastructure in place where next time there's a crisis, this is the grouping that's going to be convened by ASEAN uh, with the infrastructure there for follow through. So that's where the importance of this agreement is beyond economic, uh, I think a real framework for political cooperation as well. So. Um, I think the, the main point I want to make is we've got all these assets in the region, um, imperfect, overlapping, big gaps, but we need to use these creatively uh, to connect them better, um, both in agendas and memberships. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiro. Um, great to mention the WTO. Let's not forget that it underpins all of our endeavours and needs a lot more attention and strengthening. And RCEP, uh, you know, a, a trade agreement, Deborah also mentioned that many people have never heard of, but which provi provides all that promise if we can get the, inf the, the structure and the, the uh, right and the machinery moving. Uh, we come now to Simon Tucker, a view from business.
and look forward to your remarks. Well, kia ora, <coughs> kia ora tātou. Uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, in this magnificent building, uh, and thank you very much for, for the invitation. I think maybe it's, it's off subject, but I just wanted to pause um, and just acknowledge the incredible work that's happening in parts of our country at the moment uh, around recovery uh, from the floods, <clears throat> both out east, uh, but, but in Northland and here in, in Tamaki Makaura as well. Um, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to lose track in the uh, exhaustive media coverage, just how tough things are out there. Um, and I know as a business, we've been putting a huge amount of work in to try and get food to where it's needed and really help our farmers. But I did just want to acknowledge just the importance of us all keeping focus on that issue. Um, there are fantastic ways to contribute, and uh, I'd really just endorse that to people. Sorry, Stephen, off trade, but uh, to come back to trade. Um, you know, Fonterra is, as hopefully uh, is not news to anyone in this room, uh, a large dairy cooperative owned by about uh, 9,500 dairy farmers uh, spread across the country. Um, we are a very export-orientated business. We have a, a, a revenue of approximately $22 billion, but we export 96% of everything we, we manufacture. We sell that to somewhere around 120 countries around the world, so I would go so far to say there is probably few companies of any size in the world who care as much about um, trade uh, as, as we do. And of course, as an exporter of a highly protected, subsidised, distorted product, uh, we face a pretty challenging operating environment and we face volatility that is created by protectionism, market access, geopolitical risk. And interestingly about the global, the sort of evolving sustainability um, landscape out there. And today I want to talk about two things. I'm going to talk a bit about the UK Free Trade Agreement uh, from our perspective, and I'm going to segue on a bit and talk about trade and sustainability, which is um, an issue of vital importance. Well, I'm going to talk about FTAs. I did want to just, I guess, follow on from, from the previous comments. Um, we are a very pragmatic company, we have to be, but uh, in our ideal world, the World Trading Organization still thrives uh, and creates um, a sort of rule of law for international trade that gives us the long-term predictability and security uh, for our business. So um, we don't talk about the WTO all that much, but it's, uh, it is really, really important. So turning to the UK free trade agreement, um, the UK market is characterised by strong demand for sustainable dairy nutrition uh, that's produced to the highest quality health, safety and sustainability standards and that ticks, we think Fonterra ticks these boxes very well. Um, as I'm sure we all recall, some of uh, the younger people in the room won't perhaps only have read about it, but um, you know there was a time uh, when the UK was by far the largest market for New Zealand produced dairy products. Um, I think at one stage uh, it was something around 80% of dairy produced in New Zealand went to the UK market. Obviously in 1973 when that all changed, uh, that dropped dramatically. Um, at the time of talking right now, I think the UK is about our 73rd largest market. Um, so it's in the bottom half of our global markets. And that's because when the UK joined the European Union, it adopted the very high market access barriers that are a characteristic um, of the European Union then uh, and now. And so uh, it's a really interesting contrast to go from being a very small market behind very high tariff barriers. Uh, and we think the UK free trade agreement may significantly change the dynamics that have meant the UK has shrunk away for, for dairy exporters. Um, look, full credit, the UK FTA is, is what I would describe as a, a gold standard, high quality agreement. It's that for lots of reasons, but from the business of a food exporter, um, it's going to produce uh, tariff uh, and quota free access for all dairy products within five years, um, which uh, is remarkable uh, and it's, it's a really important outcome. We need to recall the UK by value is the world's second largest dairy import market. And for decades, um, because they've been open to the world's biggest 
dairy exporting machine, which is the European Union, um, the European Union has dominated that market. Once we're on a level playing field, uh, obviously this could change. So the commercial benefits are clear, both in terms of the opportunity to develop this new market um, that was previously inaccessible due to high tariffs, but also this point around driving higher margins to increase our share of wallet with our customers, which is critical to Fonterra's value-added strategy. Just to give you a little bit of a flavour for this, if we were exporting butter into the UK today, uh, we would pay approximately $1,100, $1,100 tariff per tonne. So the market price at the moment for butter is about $7,900 a tonne. We would pay an additional $1,100. Um, you can see why we don't sell much butter to the UK. We've got better markets where we can get more money uh, if we have to pay such a tariff. And of course, with declining milk production in New Zealand, we are focused on the products and the markets that deliver the most value back to our cooperative and to the New Zealand economy. So we are focused on the strong profit margins. And the UK is a good example of the type of market that we believe over time will align with the strategy as those FTA tariff reductions occur. FTAs like the UK agreement provide an important opportunity to access the highly discerning dairy consumption market with consumers that are prepared to pay for the New Zealand provenance, our strong sustainability credentials and the innovation. And of course we can't flood the UK market despite what some of the dairy lobbyists around the world might argue. You know, we're less than 2% of global production. We have fantastic markets in other parts of the world. But you know, if we can find some high value niches and capture the benefit of that $1,100 tariff and a disproportionate share of it, the profitability of that business becomes really, really interesting. And that's where our focus is. And look, this stuff matters to the New Zealand economy. 50% of everything we pay to our farmer owners goes to the New Zealand economy across regional New Zealand where it gets recycled many times. So trade deals that are profitable for New Zealand companies show up in all of our standards of living and it's just a really important point to, to, to bear in mind. So trade liberalisation and ex access to export markets uh, and that strong rules-based international trading system is a key priority for Fonterra out to 2050. I've already said dairy markets still remain, despite the good work of various free trade agreements and through the WTO, dairy markets are still very, very protected. We estimate we have access to only 12% of global dairy consumption if tariffs of less than 10%. Uh, you know, that's a pretty stark. We, we think we're doing well on trade liberalisation, and we are, but boy, do we have a long way to go. Um, and of course, you know, the current geopolitical context makes it even more challenging to achieve these outcomes, which is one of the reasons I think the UK deal is such a good one. Um, Maureen's going to talk uh, about the EU FTA. Um, I'm saying this somewhat tongue-in-cheek. I do acknowledge that the, UK, uh, that the EU outcome is good for a number of sectors of the New Zealand economy, but perhaps the most value to us is it acts as such a stark contrast uh, to the quality of the UK free trade agreement outcome that could be um, the most use it is to us in the end. But look, this all renews the importance of ensuring we remain focused on the key commercial priorities and ensuring exporters have high quality access to a wide range of, of high value markets. Just want to turn now just to talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, and positively, the UK Free Trade Agreement reflects shared values by including provisions in areas such as environment, animal welfare and labour. The environment chapters reaffirm New Zealand's commitments under the Paris Agreement and the ambition to be net zero by 2050. And this aligns very well with our company's strategy. We'll hit net zero by 2050 and we'll hit some pretty aggressive decarbonisation targets on the way through. As a business, we're committed to lead in sustainability. That's the place we've got to be. And it's one of the key strategic unlocks of value for us uh, in the long term. Sitting here today, New Zealand dairy enjoys uh, about the lowest carbon footprint. Um, that tonne of butter into the UK, we can get it there and it will have a significantly lower carbon footprint than something that comes across from continental Europe or something that's produced down the road in Oxfordshire. So we have a really strong low carbon credential. Um, our customers around the world are focusing on that and uh, 
you know, for New Zealand food exporters with our strong provenance, our sustainability credentials, um, we can really capitalise on that opportunity. Obviously, we're not resting on our laurels, and Stephen, you'll be happy to hear I'm going to cut out um, some of what I was going to say, but we are investing over a billion dollars uh, in the next 10 years to improve our sustainability credentials. A lot of that's going into decarbonisation, getting fossil fuels out of our manufacturing. We're uh, experimenting with electric trucks. We're doing everything we can to make sure we maintain that leadership position. Interestingly, alongside the government, fantastic partnership. We've recently allocated $50 million to put into accelerating research into methane um, reduction. 90% of our footprint comes on farm. So we really need to crack that, and we're putting serious money alongside the New Zealand government and a number of other New Zealand agribusinesses to achieve this. Mm -hmm. So the trick here is, you know, we need to protect and enhance New Zealand's world-leading uh, environmental sustainability credentials, really important aspect of, uh, of trade and sustainability. So just a couple of concluding thoughts. You know, we are seeing rising protectionism around the world, the UK, FTA in some ways, sadly, is the exception that, that proves that rule. Um, but look, the New Zealand government's doing a fantastic job under difficult circumstances. We're extremely appreciative of the work they're doing to protect existing access, working through other free trade agreements, delivering outcomes like the UK FTA um, in that difficult environment. As a business, we support embedding sustainability credentials into FTAs, as was the case with both the UK and the FTA. Uh, FTA. A key challenge going forward for negotiators, academics and business is considering, considering how this future nexus between trade policy and sustainability plays out and what role FTAs are going to play. With customers and consumers increasingly focusing on provenance and sustainability, the lack of internationally agreed standards around carbon footprinting methodologies and accounting rules are potentially the next frontier of trade barriers. Um, a compelling narrative supporting the sustainability credentials for New Zealand exporters on the global stage is critical, but we need to make sure that as these rules are developed, there is the ability for these to be done in a way which is transparent and fair. We don't want a Wild West situation where every country is going out and creating their own ways of doing this in a way that suits their particular characteristics or their particular industries. We're very happy for sustainability to be in FTAs and trade agreements, but it has to be done on a fair and objective basis. New Zealand food exporters can thrive in that environment, but you know, there's enough of a track record out there of the uh, international trade playing field being tilted against us for us to be very concerned about this issue. So look, I'll finish there. Um, really look forward to questions, and thanks again for the opportunity. Kia ora, Simon. Some great statistics that you had there. The um, uh, Fonterra having access to 12% of dairy consumption, global dairy consumption, uh, at tariffs of uh, less than 10 per, at 10% or less. Yeah, I mean, that's an extraordinary situation. Uh, the 1,100 tonnes, $1,100 a tonne of tariff you pay in the UK, uh, and the 1 billion you're putting into sustainability and, and uh, low carbon in New Zealand. All these things are related. Thank you. Maureen, you've been very patient. We're now going to hear from you, and you've had, you're involved in the uh, New Zealand Europe Institute, so you'll be talking to us about uh, New Zealand and the European Union, and anything else you would like to say. Kia ora. I've got lots. Kia ora tato katoa, ko Maureen Benson Ray, aho, and it's my pleasure to be speaking to you today, and thank you very much to the um, uh, Policy um, uh, Centre Institute for the invitation. So um, I'm um, an associate professor in international business in, here in the business school, and um, I've been researching and actually doing Europe for uh, many, many years. And um, as Stephen has said, um, I'm involved in the Europe Institute. I was one of the founding co-directors of the um, University's Europe Institute. I'm heavily involved in the New Zealand Europe Business Council. Um, and in my research and supervision, I focus on the evolving international business context and strategy context for New Zealand businesses, um, especially in the European market. Um, I won't describe the contents of the two agreements, nor rehearse the global geostrategic context for that trade, of which you will be all too aware. 
I thought that some of my comments today on the context in terms of business strategy might be helpful to broaden out the picture. Um, apologies um, uh, for um, a focus, but very clearly on the opportunities for the New Zealand SME uh, sector in the European market. Um, there are winners and losers, I think, in the European agreement, but you know, let's identify who the winners are, and especially in the SME context. Um, so I think, um, as people have said uh, earlier on, and that's the great thing about going last, I can pick up on really good comments that people have already made, um, these two free trade agreements are a starting point, not an end in themselves. Um, free trade, as Stephen has very rightly pointed out, encompasses so much more than buying and selling stuff and services, uh, managing those transactions, and moving them around the planet. I think those FTAs come at an excellent moment when we see post-COVID inward-looking policies of many governments. These also relate strongly to the strategic actions of firms, um, and we should be looking at, for example, reshoring, uh, many American companies are reshoring back to their home country, but of course including um, South America, Mexico, and the um, trade agreements there. Some observers have suggested a possible retreat to relatively less globalized value chains. These trends of deglobalization, structural reshaping of globalization and regionalization have raised concerns among academics, businesses, policymakers of an escalation of you know, this, this uh, increasingly protectionist, autarkic, being self-sufficient, you know, going back home into your home um, environment. Um, so really the opportunity of the free trade agreement with the UK, with the EU, as well as the other agreements we've been hearing about, you know, really open up our outward looking horizons and long may that continue. So I think we can debate what the outcomes are, um, you know, global benchmark on social and environmental pr uh, priorities, climate change, gender equality, indigenous business, labor rights, etc. But um, I think if we're going to see these two agreements as progressive and inclusive, we need to assess and track the opportunities that actually arise for business and how businesses here in New Zealand especially are able to take advantage of those opportunities to enable the economic and wider gains that are touted in these business agreements. Um, we can look in more specifically about, um, at uh, the EU's digital trade agenda. I think that offers huge, offers huge opportunities for New Zealand SMEs, especially as our SMEs increasingly internationalise using digital enable platforms or actually the platforms themselves. So I think we need to look much more at, tho at those um, areas as um, enablers of SME internationalisation. The European Green Deal, um, we have so much to learn. Sorry, I have drunk, uh, drunk the European Kool-Aid a bit. Um, we have so much to learn on what the Europeans are doing. I was at a, a, a presentation by a German academic on the circular economy um, initiatives that are going on there, and it, it blows your mind what is possible. We need to learn so much. Here at the university and in other research-oriented um, organisations, New Zealand's association with Horizon Europe, um, the biggest Europe, EU research and innovation fund ever, $90 billion of um, EU funding over seven years, we can now participate in that program um, and hopefully grow New Zealand's international research collaborations with those EU-based entities. Let me say a few words on um, our SMEs. SMEs are not all the same. Um, how they internationalize depends on many multiple factors. Those of you wanting more interest can come and take my course. Um, but some will start with exporting. Some will only ever export. 
that is great. But some will begin with exporting, whether it's internet enabled or actually getting on a plane and meeting people, or going to, for example, um, web-based trade fairs rather than being there in person. What they need, and De um, I think Deborah ver made the point very, very well, what they need is to reduce their risk, increase their commitment to those markets. So some will only ever um, internationalize by exporting. Many will use that as the first step in their engagement and commitment with the market. That's where the longer run implementation of this free trade agreement really opens opens up opportunities. We have some fantastic examples of New Zealand companies that are, that are known as born globals. They don't go through the domestic market particularly. They don't start slowly with export. They go straight for international markets. If the market um, openness, if the availability of relationships, of networks, of investment, of knowledge and learning in the market is there, they will go for it. So we need to see different approaches among our SMEs. This, um, the, the work we've been doing at the New Zealand Europe Business Council in close collaboration with MFAT, uh, recently we have built with MFAT um, uh, a major database of New Zealand and European companies um, which trade um, or have an interest in the European market. So there's now a database of over a thousand companies. This off offers a, an amazing opportunity to develop more research um, at the business school and we hope with the, European, the Europe Business Council and the MFAT, we're hoping to develop a longer term research project that actually tracks the outcomes, the implementation, how the free trade agreement makes a difference for our New Zealand firms. Um, he's going to hate me for it, but I especially want to recognize Colin Ballantyne, he's here somewhere, um, of your Auckland office, MFAT, who's worked so hard to achieve great results. He's worked with the Business School, he's over there, uh, with the Business Council, with the Europe Institute, and the business community here in Auckland. Thanks, Colin. So, um, in closing, um, and well in time, because nobody's held up the little um, uh, thing at the, over there, um, there are so many research questions, there are so many real business experiences that we need to track as these free trade agreements, and especially the one with the European Union, which I see as holding so much promise, actually delivers. So we need to understand where are our firms now? Which ones are exporting? Where do they get their knowledge? Where are their market partners? Where are they likely to invest? Where are their customers? What's actually going on as we go into that um, free trade agreement? What information do they need? Where do they find their information? What more can New Zealand Inc. do to support pre-exporters? Um, I think, um, um, I think Deborah made the very, very good point that exporting is hard when you start, but we know from research that once you start, once you make a commitment to, tr to trying and um, getting into international markets, the research shows that you're likely to keep going and try it again. So we need to get that, that sustainable in terms of long run a view of um, performance of firms. Um, the FTAs will no doubt generate winners and there may be some losers. Who are they? How can we help them? How can we learn with them? What about new emerging industries that we haven't even thought of yet? So um, what we do here at the university is we come up with research questions. I've got lots, I've got a few answers, but let's keep the conversation going. I think there are huge opportunities in these trade relations Business relations between Australia, New Zealand, and the EU are increasingly characterized by knowledge flows, cooperation for innovation, and strategic diversification by firms and industries. Let's have a look at more of that. Thank you. Kia ora, Maureen. That was an uh, um, excellent place to, um, you know, uh, sum up the discussions that had gone before, and I think really interesting highlighting the work that needs to be done 
uh, to between academics and business organisations and the government to turn these opportun to turn these agreements into real opportunity. And very interesting uh, to hear about the work you're doing, particularly with SMEs. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to come to some uh, questions now, and I want you to think of um, some pithy questions to ask this extraordinarily um, talented ta uh, panel. But I want to start first of all, just with one or two, and I will come back to you. I promise. Uh, just to get the ball rolling. And I want to focus firstly on the trade and investment impacts of um, FTAs, uh, because we've heard a lot about the multiple objectives that are involved in FTAs. And I want to ask Simon, who has talked to us uh, about the NZUK FTA, uh, with references to the NZEU FTA, uh, but I want to ask Simon about what a company like Fonterra thinks about these big mega regionals CPTPP and RCEP that might not deliver the market access gains that you're looking for, but could deliver in other areas? Yeah, uh, thanks, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, look, I think from an immediate trade perspective, uh, some of the, the, the mega regionals, RCEP is a good example, um, they're not actually bringing necessarily more market access. Um, and I'm sure people will forgive us. First and foremost, we are interested if we can actually sell products into countries. But of course, the reason they're not bringing new market access is because the New Zealand government for years has done a good job of putting in place bilateral free trade agreements. So, um, but we remain very interested uh, in how um, expansion of these deals or maturity of these mega deals might lead over time to further market access gains or to bringing additional countries in that would have to meet the standard established. And I think, you know, CPTPP uh, is an interesting opportunity um, in that respect. But pr probably the second thought, and it's, it's an obvious one, but, you know, in this time when we do see... Um, you know, signs of rising protectionism. We see the WTO in, uh, under significant threat. Um, you know, trade positive mega deals that provide companies with a sense of um, consistency and predictability to internet to, to regional trade rules are really, really important. Um, and you know, I think we welcomed RCEP um, in, in part because it was just a statement that seemed to run against the current of events, you know, that, that here was a bunch of countries saying, no, trade's important and we're going to do some stuff and we're going to actually put this stake in the ground. So I think, you know, that's a good thing. Mm. Debbie, if I could ask you, bilateral, mega-regional, what works best in terms of trade growth? How do we make, how do we turn these big mega-regionals into commercial success? So the regional agreements are easier for companies because the rules are the same in multiple places, right? So I use RCEP as a classic example. If I want to export you know, microphones, let's say, in RCEP, I make this microphone to meet the RCEP rules of origin. And once I've done so, I can then export it without having to change out the parts, the components, the, I don't know what, I don't even know what's in a microphone, but whatever's in here. I don't have to swap out like this part's from Korea and that one's from Japan and this part's got Chinese input and here's some from New Zealand. I don't have to do any of that. I make it for our set rules of origin, done. I need one certificate of origin. It's exactly the same form. It goes into all of the 15 markets at once. For an exporter, that is so much easier than having to go through potentially 15 different bilaterals and swap out the content change the form. I mean, the risk to a company of getting it wrong when you have lots of forms to fill out is high. I have to train everyone in my company about, like, if this microphone goes to Korea, then this is the parts and components it has to have. These are the only approved suppliers. This is the documentation we need that goes with it. If we then sell this microphone into Japan, we can't use those parts and components. We have to use these parts and components. We have to use this sheet of paper. The, it's very, the, the risk of getting it wrong is high, and the penalties can be significant. Significant. The one downside I would say for all, most companies in using these trade agreements is that the benefits can be significant. But when I go and I talk to lots of different companies, and Fonterra is an exception, most of them will say, yeah, we use the trade agreement, whatever it is. Yeah, we use this. And then you say, well, can you point me to the person who actually does this within your company? And you quickly discover that even large companies that you would assume would benefit from a trade agreement haven't got a clue 
they all think that somebody else does it. They're like, well, of course we use this trade agreement. Of course we do, because it went from, you know, our tariff was 20%, now it's zero, of course we use it. Then you'd look and they were like, well, I don't do it. I think it's legal and compliance that does it. No, 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 it's supply chain that does it. No, 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 it's our procurement people who do it. No, 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 it's our 3PL who does it. No, 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 it's our... Nobody's actually doing it in most companies. And so one big challenge we often face in terms of, of using these trade agreements is making sure that the company is aware of what they need to do, who in the company is responsible for it, and then that it actually gets done. And crucially for large companies, please not on Excel spreadsheet, and, and if you're a small company, not on the back of a napkin. Because you have to keep, you know, you, you're not gonna get this done well if you're not paying attention. And I'm always shocked by the amount of money that is left on the table, especially for larger or medium-sized companies, from failing to use the trade benefits. It's just, it's mind-blowing. The same thing is true for services firms as well. I would say it's not just about trade and goods. But a lot of the services companies haven't got a clue that there are actually agreements with rules and provisions and commitments that might make a difference. And so, you know, again, if you're not paying attention to these, especially these newer ones, and as certainly CPTPP, uh, in terms of actually delivering real-world benefits to companies, then you're missing an opportunity. Great, thank you very much. And, and uh, share along similar lines, you talked very optimistically about the RCEP. I'm a member of the RCEP Business Advisory Council. We're actually having a meeting later on today. Um, and um, obviously focusing a lot on making that agreement work, but how confident are you that the structures that are being put in place can actually manage uh, you know, the sort of process that need to happen to give effect to what Debbie's just been saying. Yeah, look, thanks, Stephen. Um, I, I think I am pretty optimistic, and the reason I'm optimistic is because ASEAN as, is at its core, um, and, you know, it's all very frustrating how slow ASEAN moves from time to time, you know, consensus-driven. Um, uh, but it has succeeded in putting this agreement together at such a crucial time. And uh, as Deborah said, you know, the, the rules of origin, having a single rule of origin across the whole region, it, it simplifies all these bilateral agreements that um, have been inconsistent in all the paperwork. Uh, so that's a huge, a huge contribution, um, not to mention bringing Japan, South Korea and China into an agreement for the first time. Um, so you know, how optimistic am I that it'll simplify all sorts of things that Deborah said? Well, that's going to be up to companies and countries um, to help with the facilitation uh, and utilisation of these agreements. Um, but just the fact that we, we have this head start and this opportunity, I, I think, is huge. Now, um, you know, what, what we do with it's another thing, and I, I um, mentioned the cooperation agenda. I think that's where a lot of the action's at now, and that's where I think the policy resources should be focused. Um, that uh, and, and other regionals. Now, I think we're well past um, diminishing returns on bilateral agreements. We've signed so many. Um, New Zealand's led the way in this. Um, there are some other big ones to be done, um, but you know, I think after that, you'd want to focus on the, the bigger game. Um, you know, you get sectoral benefits out of the, the bilateral free trade agreements. There's, there's no doubt about that, um, but. You know, as we talked about yesterday, with the whole system under threat from rising protectionism, we need to put effort into the bigger agreements that have a bigger dif make a bigger difference um, in the global system. Mm. Thanks for that. I'm sure that um, Bright MFAT um, recruits can tell us how many FTAs we have with Singapore. Any guesses? But I'm not even sure I know the number. More than that. Four. Yeah, four or five. If you count it deeper, maybe. Uh, um, it's a lot, it's a lot. So wrapping them up makes sense. I should just add, I, I think New Zealand's leadership role in creating the P4 that turned into the TPP, deeper, and these agreements that uh, expand and are open access are a huge, a huge um, contribution. Uh, and this is where the, the sort of policy innovation, the thinking um, needs to be going forward. Mm. Thank you. Let me just turn briefly to the sustainability question, though. And Maureen, you talked a bit about, uh, uh, about that in, in your remarks just now, and rightly so. When you look at that EU New Zealand FTA, do you think this is the high watermark that we have reached now on sustainability uh, provisions and FTAs, or is there more that can be done? And I don't know, what's the best part about it? Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, it's mind-boggling how... Um, ambitious the 
climate change and sustainability elements of, of both agreements are, but especially with the European Union. Um, the EU delegation um, here in New Zealand has done a lot of work to explain, especially from, from the EU side, the um, European um, the Green Deal, um, which aims towards um, carbon neutrality in the European Union by 2050, making it the first climate neutral continent in the world. A, a hugely ambitious agenda, and I think it's um, going to be um, uh, quite challenging for New Zealand, for New Zealand businesses, to um, understand what they need to do as part of that, and also to respond to increasing requirements uh, um, uh, in, in that context for doing trade and business in, into the EU. But if I go back to the position of our New Zealand firms, we know that when they go international, um, our small and medium-sized enterprises, they don't know everything. They're learning as they go, they're getting market knowledge, they're learning, um, picking up through their networks, through um, adaptation and responding um, to the market conditions. So I think they will bring a lot of that learning back with them. So even though it might look daunting, ambitious, the EU is always over ambitious. Um, it's part of that dialectic they have, they sort of go, two steps forward, one step back, that's what they do. But um, I think um, it, it, will, it, will, it will push us along um, to uh, respond and adopt um, some of those um, aspects too. Mm. Yeah. And perhaps, perhaps was, th thank you very much for that. Perhaps for you, Stuart, um, just in terms of sustainability provisions, do you foresee that we will improve again on the EU outcome? Uh, obviously, with some of our um, mega regionals, there's a bit of way to go, uh, most particularly in RCEP, I would suggest. But what's your view? Look, it's it's an interesting one. I mean, um, as, as you said, the European Commission described it as the greenest ever FTA. So, look, at the moment, it's a high watermark. Great. You can always go higher. Um, I think, you know, I'm conscious it's the 40th anniversary of CER. Um, what can we do with our Australian cousins? Um, sort of particularly in the trade and environment space, I think there are, there are more places to go. On this, I'll be interested to see where IPF lands in some of this. Um, again, your point, Maureen, is we have a lot in common with the EU in this space, so it's inevitable that that's, that's where we are now. But again, you, you, you've got mind-boggling where we've reached now. What's mind-boggling now in 10 years just might be passe, so let, let's wait and see. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Stuart. Simon. Yeah, well, I think, as as said, you know, we're, we're really happy to front up and, and participate in... In, in free trade agreements or, or any sort of trade agreement that includes strong sustainability components, provided you know there is a, a sort of fair and objective way that th those are looked at. I mean, I, and, and as you know, we can see them as actually being very good for our our sort of business proposition. I would observe, um, you know, it is it's a tough environment out there because the um, the coffers of the European Union and the United States in particular. I mean, there is literally tens of billions of dollars of subsidies being shoveled at farmers. Um, and look, these may or may not be good for the planet. I sure as hell hope they are. Um, but you know, then then we see, um, you know, that this is going to play a part in the competitive dynamic out there in, in, in global dairy, which is fine. We're up for that competition. But you know, there is a asymmetry to, to some of these situations, which for New Zealand businesses we, we need to be aware of. In, in our dreams, uh, we would love to see free trade agreements put disciplines on any subsidies that distort trade. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Message received. Look, I, I could carry on like this all day, you know. Uh, it's really great, but I do want to allow some time for questions. And there was one just down, down here from the floor, and please identify yourself. Uh, good morning all, I'm Beatrice, for those of you I haven't met yet. Um, my question kind of follows on from what you've just been talking about in that my perception of free trade agreements and international law is that they're very much catching up to what's happening in the world. And so we've had lots of discussions on sustainability, indigenous trade, the digital economy. Um, and so my question is, what can New Zealand do to proactively respond to these issues instead of 
reactively um, creating responses to them, particularly to create business certainty in light of lots of discussions around carbon border tax adjustments and how we can bind multinationals to human rights obligations for um, due diligence and supply chains. Kia ora. Well, there's, there's one for, for you, panel. What do you think? It's going to start with me, isn't it? Look, look, that's a PhD answer as well, to be honest. So it's, it's, it's a complex question. You've got a few PhDs. So, here, so. yeah, we, we, we do indeed. And I mean, I think I'd, I'd probably take issue in terms of the reactive, because I think I'd say that New Zealand would probably hold its head up and say we have been proactive in this space. Um, you know, we have pushed ahead, ahead of pretty much any other country in terms of the trade and sustainability, in terms of supporting indigenous trade through a range of mechanisms. But let, let's not lose sight of the fact that, you know, FTAs are one very small part of this. It's what you actually do at home that can make a difference. It's how is the government getting in and actually taking this seriously and supporting sustainability, supporting Māori businesses? What are we actually doing on the ground? What are the, the other NZ Inc parties um, you're going to hear from Phil Holding and MPI and what they're doing on the sustainability front, you know, um, NZTE. So you get answers in those kind of spaces. But we are trying to be, um, you know, we have, um, you know, um, a range of agreements that have come out of um, New Zealand, um, GTAG, a global trade um, and gender. We have um, um, agreement on climate change, ACCTS, that we're negotiating again. That's in many ways been driven a lot out of New Zealand. Steph's talked about deeper. So we are trying to be at the cutting edge of this. So when you consider that we're at the cutting edge of something, despite being a population of five million and probably having one of the smallest um, trade ministries out there, we're doing as much as, as we can. There will be more. We'll continue to look and see how we can correct it. There's a man in the corner, the Evangelist, that's always coming up with new ideas. Um, we can't always keep up with all his new ideas, but there are, you know, he has many of them, and, and many of the things we've talked about today all came out of that corner. So I think it's, it's fair to say, you know, we're continually looking, we're continually reflecting. Sometimes you're right, government will be reactive because, you know, we, we're going to be a little bit behind the eight ball. Frankly, when um, you look at um, what happened with TPP, we had to be reactive because we were probably a bit slow to catch up with the, the public zeitgeist. So that's sometimes the nature of government. But I do think, you know, it, you, we can hold our heads up and say we are probably being more proactive than pretty much any other country out there in terms of that sustainability and inclusion. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Debbie, do you have a view on that? Is business, is, is government catching up with business or is business no, catching up with government? No, I think business will always be out in front on, especially some of those, you know, edge things. Just, just the nature of the beast. I mean, I, I will reflect back on time, for example, in RCEP e-commerce negotiations. So RCEP, at the time we had 16 countries, now 15, trying to negotiate e-commerce without meaning any disrespect to various government officials, I kid you not, people would look through the window and they would say, I don't understand how my data is in that cloud. Can you explain to me what that cloud, how that cloud knows where I am? You know, and you're thinking, okay, well, we have got a bit of an issue here if we're trying to do cutting edge digital and we're looking out the window at the cloud to find your information. I mean, we, so there's a gap. The long and the short of it is there is a gap between where business is at and where government is at. And, you know, some governments are closer to the, the, to the reality of business than others, and I am happy to say that I, I did not hear those kinds of comments coming from uh, New Zealand's MFAT officials. But, um, you know, that's, that's the reality, is you're working with officials who are, they're not in business, and many, most, I would argue most, especially in the, the region, they don't have very good connections between government and business. They don't listen to business, they're not in business themselves, they don't have that sort of transmission belt, and so they don't have any idea what business wants or needs. And that is a real problem when you're talking about particularly digital, but also sort of, you know, anything that's new and innovative. And so, you know, what can New Zealand do in that space? I think a, a couple of things. One is to lead by example, which I, I think they do do. Uh, the second is to encourage those sort of stakeholder engagements, to encourage p businesses especially, but not just businesses, to come in and they say where they're at, what are they looking for. Um, another is to engage in capacity building for government officials, because they're not going to change their policies if they don't even understand the environment that they're living in. And so I think there are some things you can do, but at the end of the day, if we've got officials looking for clouds, then they're not going to be looking at cutting edge, you know, artificial intelligence kinds of algorithms, anything. We're not there. 
And if you start talking about some of the, the newer digital policies to some government officials, then you've lost them completely. So you have to kind of, you know, you have to calibrate this carefully. But I do think that that stakeholder engagement is absolutely vital. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maureen. Um, yes, I'll just follow up on, on Deborah's point. Um, I was talking to um, one of your MFAT colleagues earlier on who said that um, there's, I think, 32 new entrants into MFAT and part of this program. Um, you, as up-and-coming young diplomats, um, uh, trade negotiators, um, policy um, uh, formers. Um, you know who your friends are. You know who your contemporaries are. Um, here at the, um, the university in the business school, for many years we've run a, um, a competition for business startups um, and um, in our Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, over the years, um, we've moved away from purely commercial startups to our young people coming through, wanting to set up um, uh, businesses, uh, sustainable, value, um, values-driven, um, ethical trading businesses uh, with a social and environmental agenda right at the forefront. Those are the future business leaders you are going to be interacting with. So keep relevant, keep talking to your peers because they are going to come through and they will be the business leaders and they will be changing the way we see and do business. And, um, you know, and it's a jolly good thing in my view. Great. Thank you. At the back there. Kia ora. I'm Kelly Garton and I'm at the School of Population Health at the University of Auckland. Um, I primarily work in tobacco, alcohol and food policy. Um, so yeah, my question is probably mostly to Stuart, but curious to hear what the whole panel thinks. I recognize that MFAT's been doing a lot of work on um, preserving our right to regulate in the public interest. And um, I'm wondering to what extent has the health sector been involved in that process to make sure we're really covering all of our bases and then future proofing for emerging health threats. Um, but also further to that, we've obviously made a lot of progress um, in terms of sustainability provisions. I'm wondering, is there scope for agreements that explicitly promote health in the future? I noticed a, a big, <laughs> is it on? Yeah, I noticed a big round of you. Yeah, that'll be you to handle, Stu. Good. Um, <laughs> look, I think, um, I mean, fundamentally, that point, that right to regulate sort of does sit at the top, and I think it's fair to say that when we're, when we're conducting consultations, we're very, you know, government departments look at the stuff very carefully because they are the regulators and they want to make sure that we're not going to be stepping on their toes or if they are, they understand where those constraints are. And I think we've been very cognizant, probably going back since the Uruguay round, of the importance of health and the importance of a right to regulate in the health space. And you've seen that play out, for example, the examples that, that Moana put up yesterday in terms of Australia taking on Philip Morris and things like that. And you know, that stuff is a fundamental premise in New Zealand. So I think you, know, you can be pretty confident that there's that focus. Um, but you raise an interesting question. We are very big on sustainability and inclusion. So where is the elements of, of you know, the sort of the health benefits of, of, of trade? Um, I'd sort of probably defer to others on, on, on that one because it's it, it probably something that needs more thinking about. Thank you. Was there another question? Oh, St Steph, Stephanie Honey, here present. Thanks. Thanks very much, Stephanie Honey. Kia ora. Um, this is really a question for Shiro and Debbie. Uh, you both sort of alluded to IPEF um, and then also talked about these, these um, mega regionals, CPTPP and RCEP. Um, would love to hear a bit more of both of your perspectives on that. Is IPF going anywhere? Um, obviously, it doesn't include market access per se, but it does tackle some really important non-tariff barriers to trade around digital or supply chains. Um, so, is that you know, in, in a year's time, are we going to be looking back on how IPF was was done, and where does China sit in this new landscape? Thanks. Okay, I promised Cheryl that I would take IPEF questions if they came up. Um, if you said to me, if, can you make a trade agreement that does interesting things that we haven't yet covered in a trade agreement that 
allows for flexibility and new opportunities, et cetera, I would say, yeah, there's a lot of things that we can, a trade agreement does a lot of stuff. But it doesn't cover everything. There's a lot that's outside the structure of a current trade agreement. The more you try to throw into a trade agreement, the harder it is to get the thing finished in the first place, the harder it is to implement. So could I make a trade agreement or a framework that deals with important issues that, that especially impede trade, because it's supposed to still be about trade, I would say, yeah, I could come up with that. Is IPEF that model? That's a tough one. You know. Um, I was just in Washington last week and talking to folks about IPEF in particular. I mean, this is the analogy that I think makes the most sense about IPEF. We are in a plane in IPEF, the people who are creating IPEF, building the plane while it's in the air. So in the air, trying to build this airplane with no real sense of what the airplane should look like because we've taken all the past blueprints and tossed them out the window as being inadequate unacceptable, so no blueprints, here we are in the air. We don't know how the plane should look, we don't really know what it should do, and we haven't got a clue how to land it. And so you can imagine there is enormous amount of anxiety of all the folks who are on this plane who are saying, well, wh wh wait, what, wh we're doing what? Wait, we're on this plane and we're going, wh what, you want us to help you build this? And the assumption, of course, as you would imagine, is that the Americans must have a blueprint. Right? They must, because they wouldn't have put us in this plane and taken off if they didn't know where the hell we were going. And yet, the U.S. genuinely, I think, is looking for advice and input on how to build the plane, what it should look like, where it should land, what can it do. And this is creating tremendous anxiety, and if that wasn't enough to cause you a bit of heart palpitations, the deadline is, it, it, the landing is right around the corner. I mean, the intention is to have some kind of IPEF deliverable this year under U.S. APEX host agenda. And so if you work backwards knowing how APEC works, that means you've got to have something lined up by August in order for you to get everybody to sign off on it and vet it and da-da-da-da-da before you can say something about it in November. So that means it's, it's almost March. We haven't seen key parts of the blueprint. U.S. hasn't tabled big parts of this what they hope to see. So to get that done between March and, and August is going to be tough. So uh, the first question, you know, is it going to be meaningful? I think it's possible. Again, I think there's scope for interesting things. Are we going to deliver it now? Uh, uh, I mean, it is going to require a level of cooperation and innovation that I would find shocking if the 14 participating countries could come together and actually deliver on it. But there is scope. I mean, so this is the sort of dilemma of IPEF, right? There are things you can imagine in an IPEF that could be useful, valuable, meaningful. There are lots of things, and many of them have been discussed here, that are not in a traditional trade deal that could be included in an IPEF. And so, you know, I hope that as we're building this airplane, we're thinking creatively about what is it we want it to do? And what could we add to that agenda in a realistic way that sets us up for landing in November, some parts of this plane at least in November, and then working on it, fingers crossed, after that. But it's a tough one. And so my last point on IPEF, just to, to finish what's, be, I'm, I'm sorry, been a long answer, is um, it's not a trade agreement. So you can't think of IPEF in the same category as ANSFA, TA, RCEP, CPTPP, a bylaw. It's not. It's a something different. Doesn't mean it's better, doesn't mean it's worse, it's just different. So try not to think about IPEF in that same category, and then whenever you see whatever it is that they design, maybe you'll be either more or less impressed. Okay, um, look, in the interest of time, I do have two questions over there. I just want to ask Jennifer if I can just carry on for a little bit, because we are just coming to the end. Can I carry on for five minutes? Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, yes, please. Hi, um, open question to anyone, but perhaps specifically Stu and Shiro. Um, I'm interested in, I guess, the development of standards in regional agreements versus WTO rules in the context of harmonisation. I've heard there's sort of interest and opinions actually against having varying standards across all different regions in the way that this might actually thread in a centralised rules-based order, perhaps through... Uh, standards fragmentation. I'd like to see, hear your opinions on that, whether you think that holds true or false. We'll let you take that, Shira. Yeah, look, thanks for the question. It's an important one. And I think you look at the CPTPP, which was a hub and spokes arrangement, right, where the United States would negotiate with every other country. Um, and 
there is a risk of doing regional agreements or bilateral agreements that just have vastly different standards and rules um, that would make it complicated for business, especially small, medium-sized business that just doesn't have the capacity to, to navigate this. And so it's not really contributing to you know, free and open trade and investment economic exchange. Um, but that's where I think RCEP is pretty important. And it's ASEAN's agenda on supply chains and integrating into the global economy, not just itself, where um, it has simplified um, rules of origin um, and trying to consolidate its ASEAN plus um, free trade agreements. So it's the first time we've really seen uh, a consolidation of these bilateral agreements. And I think that's the direction we need to go um, because, uh, as Stephen mentioned, I mean, just between us, New Zealand and Singapore, but Singapore and everyone, there are so many overlapping agreements. You can pick and choose and it's, it gets a little bit ridiculous. We need to start to consolidate uh, and simplify so that we don't run into the problems that, that you implied. Mm -hmm. I think we had another question there. No. You're right. Well, look, we are just about it. Did you want to add a quick word? We're just, we are at the end of our time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it's been a most, um, I think, rich discussion between a very, very knowledgeable panel. We've covered all sorts of aspects of FT, the FTA agenda, uh, the relevance in terms of business growth and market access, the relevance in terms of sustainability in terms of inclusion, uh, particularly, uh, and the need to make them work for SMEs. Uh, and, um, you know, all of these are bundled up in this uh, enterprise of, of rulemaking uh, and standard setting and hopefully tariff cutting uh, that goes on around our region. So on your behalf, I want to thank them all. I want to thank all of you for your being so patient and for the excellent questions. Uh, and I'm sure the rest of the day is going to be uh, equally as valuable. No reda, inga mana, inga reo, inga reo, it fano neo tinekura, a tena koto, a tena koto kiora, kia kaha. Tena koto katoa. Thanks, great job.